Well, you got the dog, eh? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not used to that, so I don't want to disturb. Would you... Would you excuse me? Yeah, that's it. Mm. I just want it's just because I have a little bit of uh, more than usual to cover. So that's why I would like to start straight on time, kind of right now. Um, I don't want to wait for the people that come late today simply because I don't have enough material to do two sessions but enough for maybe an hour 10 minutes at the most I think it's going to work out properly thank you so much for understanding this we have a meeting of the board we have a meeting of the board after the class at 12 sharp and if you want to stay for this you you can stay and uh, if not no big deal uh, we'll see how it goes from there once again, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, some people are absent working. Marilyn is not here today. Brendan is not here today. And I don't know about the rest of the crew and so on. I would like to have you this morning in Colossians chapter 4, chapter 3 rather, verses 18 to 21. And on your outlines, uh, page 2 of your outlines, second page of your outlines, which is the last also, under Roman 5, and you scroll down under be the guidelines, and you go to Arabic number 2 in our home. Uh, because it's capital be the guidelines, practical applications for our calling that we receive in the Messiah. And then we did the everyday life two weeks ago, or last week. And then we do in our home. I want to thank you also for those, yeah, this is work, yeah, good, thank you for asking, I appreciate that. I want to thank you those who follow, there is quite a few number actually that follow on the uh, YouTube channel and I appreciate that also. Why don't we take a time of silence and then I will bring you to the study and we will finish it today for sure. So sharpen your pencils, I'm not going to go terribly fast, but we, we will make it work. Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the only covenant-keeping God that does exist, with which we sustain a relationship with. We come thanking you, Father, since today this is our last session of the book of Colossians. After having studied together Galatians, in its fullness, Ephesians, Philippians in this book, and especially Ephesians and Colossians, Father, which books to ground a person in the body of the Messiah. What it is to be a church saint, what it is to partake in the church for what's left of it, and what it is to walk with you. We give you thanks this morning for your kindness and patience. Help me by your grace alone, to be able to finish it properly, as I always do in a sense, to apply the best of my abilities to teach these books which an extreme, with an extreme carefulness. We pray this, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Caroline, join us. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 to 21. I don't need to make a review at this time. We just go under capital B, under Arabic 5, the guidelines and practical applications of our calling. In our home, chapter 3, verses 18 to 21, where Paul here is a little bit more practical. Come with me, 318. We read straight down to 21. It's not a long section. Wives, be subject, circle subject to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord, circle fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not embitter against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, 
Do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Right at the outset of it, there could be no appreciation of this, the principle of subjection and the principle of submission between a husband and a wife without reflecting or having studied the doctrine of the Trinity. Nobody in our Christian faith would be bold enough to baptize a person in the name of the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father. They are very, very careful to follow the order because that's the order given. But when it's time to talk about subjection and submission between a husband and a wife, they waver, which I do not appreciate at all. The principle of submission and the principle of subjection, the wife to the husband and so forth, goes back. It arcs back to the time of the creation, even the material creation and the creation of Adam and Eve. Okay? It goes back to there, and if we fail or we allegorize these things and so on, we lose sight of these two words, and the two words are subjection and submission. It has done nothing to do with culture or ages. There is only one body of scriptures given. We call it the oracles of God, the Bible. And we cannot take a culture and make it fit in the Bible. The Bible has to fit in the culture of the people on the planet. In verse 8... Excuse me, would you repeat that again? Um, about the culture and... The, we, the people, they try to make the culture fit in the Bible to accommodate their displeasing. Okay. of obeying commandments in the Lord, it should not work that way. The culture has to bow the knee to the text. Oh, okay. okay? Uh, it has uh, nothing to do with um, basically uh, superiority and inferiority. In verse 18, wives, be subject to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. As fitting in the Lord here, you can circle only the word fitting because the Stoics, the Greek philosopher, they are called the Stoics. They like in their philosophy to say, okay, we need to do this because it is fitting to do so. And Paul uses the same expression, but he adds three words, fitting unto the Lord. So the fitting here is not something about the Greek philosophy. It is something about the word of God. That's why in verse 18, it has, it has the fitting unto the Lord. So there is, there is only one God or one Lord. That's why it is fitting. Yes. Growing up, I learned women are supposed to submit to the husband. Yes. But I was never taught the second half. And it's the same with the long hair. Women should cover their heads, but they never say in men. Like so many preachers, women submit, women cover their heads, but they don't talk about what the men are supposed That's to That's it. So but you, we need to address both the issues. Spirit of rebellion. That's it. That's, that, 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 this is a resistance to the Word of God. Uh, like I was explaining at the beginning, just make sure that uh, we keep it concise because I have quite a bit of a. No, don't be sorry because you were not there. Uh, I have a kind of a full session to do in, because I don't have enough to do next week and I don't want to go there. So uh, it goes back to the notes of Ephesians. You can compare your notes in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 to 24. He talks again the principle of subjection, the wife giving it a picture. But keep in mind and make a note that in Colossians here, Paul uses the same wording for home. About the principle of subjection, Paul uses the same wording for at home. And when he does it in Ephesians chapter 5, he does it in relationship to Christ being the head of the church or the head of the bride. So you can see that you have one more, you have more than one passage to lean on and to understand these things. Okay, I repeat the last statement, which is good, because together we have done Ephesians. So when Paul wrote both, he wrote Ephesians. In Ephesians, his emphasis about the subjection and so on and the obedience to, it's in regards to Christ, the head of the church. And the church member has to be in subjection to the head, meaning in subjection to Christ. 
But here in Colossians, it talks about the relationship at home. It has nothing to do at the church meeting. It's in the church daily life. Okay? Verse 19, husband, love your wives and do not embitter against them. The word husband here in the Greek is andres, A-N-D-R-E-S. And it refers here to a male only. So this is the husband. The husband is given two commandments. To love, in verse 19, circle love, this is the agapeo. This is a command to love the wife in all situations, even in tight moments. It's a continuous love at all times, in all situations. You've made a commitment, you've made a commitment. The second thing that uh, the husband ought to do, it's not to embitter against them. The them is the wives. Because there is a difference between bitter, bitterness and sweetness. And believe you me, I am a husband. All the male that I make eye contact with are husband. And it takes a lifetime of sanctification to have it together. Because sometimes we lose it. We lose the patience and it creates bitterness instead of sweetness. So be kind with yourself. Practice these things and submit to these things. Don't, don't stiffen the knees to these things. This is a lifelong process. Since in these classes we understand very strongly the principle of sanctification. It's a daily thing. These scriptures, like my sister was pointing out, Caroline, are not very much expounded nowadays simply because of the satanic warfare and the world system that basically overflows onto the church. Ladies, the, the Woman's Day and everything has crept in in the church, so that's why right now churches as new life here, they, they start to allow, a few years ago they started to allow women elders, and now women can speak. So they are not out of the bush. The issue has to be dealt at the core of these things. Women cannot be elders in the church, and women cannot preach in the church. All right? And males are also to blame because they do not take their responsibility to do so. Okay? So just keep that in mind so that our walk may make a difference trying to attract the people not with cultural and slackness issue, but to attract the people to a God who is demanding order. Verse 20, children. The children is ta, tekna. I will read that down for you. This has to be noted later. later. Ta, tekna. That's the Greek word. You don't need to remember that, but what it means it means all dependent upon the parents for family, for fi family physical needs. Example for me, Sophia. She's under my fridge. She's under the, 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 the cupboard for the food. Okay? She's dependent upon the parents for daily physical needs. And while she is there, she ought to obey us. It's not talking about children grown up. Let them go to work. You don't need to provide for them. They have to work if they need to find two jobs. Let's do so. You don't need to pay houses for them. The children are the dependent on the house. They need to obey you. Once they move on with their life, they're not under you, under your leadership. They don't need to obey you. They need to honor you, but not to obey you. The commands here for the children has three features attached to it. It's obey, and obey is to hear. 
So that's why sometimes you might use expression with your kids in the past. Hey, Sophia, hear me. And it's correct. And the Greek word has the word upa, H-U-P-A, before the word for obey, and it means under. Obey since you are under me. Principle of submission, principle of subjection in the family. Upa kuete. Like this. Upa, it's the part that means under. Kuete. Okay? Obedience under the leadership of, under the authority. They need to be taught to listen and obey. And believe you me, it's a ballpark today with everything that they have access to. Number two. Out of three things in that verse, circle parents. It's not two moms, it's not two dads. It's the mama and the dad together, the husband and the wife, male and female. Anything outside of that is not acceptable in the scriptures. They need to see a witness and a godly pattern displayed by the parents. And again, it's in the context of saved parents here. Unfortunately, there is context apart from this one, when the parents, one come to Christ or none is to Christ and so on, but still the biblical principle. But in the context of Colossians here, it's saved parents. Because I was brought up in a non-Christian family However, I was given good values, not all the time, but I was given good values that basically permeates to the world system, even if they don't sustain a relationship with Christ. Number three, you circle in verse 20, in all things. What is in all things? It's in all things, daily life, playing, church, beach, Restaurants, social activities. It's in all things. <clears throat> Ask me why all this? You have, the, you have the answer in verse 20 at the end. Why all this? Because God is pleased by this. God is pleased by this. He likes it when the people submit. They see mom and dad having a discussion. The mom should say to the husband, husband, I gave you my input, husband. Now, husband, you call the shot. It's for you to make the decision. I will approve and be behind your decision no matter what. The kids, they hear that. So it becomes for them, oh, mom is not resisting and trying to be above daddy. So I should take my place also. Good luck nowadays. With all that stuff. Okay, we're doing well. Am I doing too fast? Okay, just want to make sure that we treat seriously. Verse 21, fathers. Of course, it does include here both mom and dad, but he says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Okay, I like the word exasperate in Greek. Make a note of this one. I'm going to erase a few words here. To accommodate. Okay, uh, the word exasperate is ere. Okay, uh, where? Thiso. Ere thiso. Try to memorize this one, at least in English, what it means also. It means to steer them up. To steer them up, S-T-I-R, to steer them up. Okay? In the New Testament, the eri, thiso, has a bad or a negative connotation, as well as a good connotation. When you go to 2 Corinthians, don't go, I'll go for you. 2 Corinthians, you have an image of something positive with that word to steer them up, 9-2. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2 says this, For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely, that Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. It's in regard to the nation. And your zeal has stirred up most of them. They have seen something positive and they want to be stirred up by this. It's positive there. Here, it's negative. In that case here, it's negative. It's in here, talking about emotion. Yeah, it's talking about uh, to provoke producing strife, basically. To provoke the child, the, the child provoke, provoking strife. And basically, it's not to fret them or harass them. I'm not done. It's not to scare them with the authority and not to harass them. Because if we harass them, we fret them, and we are too harsh with them, the child reaches a point of saying within his heart, it's impossible to please them. And it will affect your Christian walk for the rest of your existence. You become so overwhelmed by mom and dad that you say to yourself, I will never get it together. Thoughts of suicide, discouragement, drugs would be healed not 100% if the people would let them be to an extent. He is not strong in math, so be it, hammer nails. You're not going to become a scientist. So when we get too pressure of them, harassing them, you're just as this and that, which my dad did to me, and I bear the backpack still. Okay? So this is kind of a, something very precious unto us. They ought to be corrected, not by hurting them, but by persuading them. It's way faster to get the rule on the bums or smack. It's very quick. But to sit down and have a conversation and you shut down the stupid phone takes much longer time, but it's more efficient. Proverbs 19, 18. Point number three on your outline Slave-master relationships, 22 to 4, 1. Come with me. Master's relationship, masters, no, nope. verse 22, slaves, circle slaves. In all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do you work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Circle that sentence. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Draw a pencil line after that sentence. This is point number three on your outlines. When you go back to verse 22, don't be offended by the language of the Old Testament here or the New Testament. You can put, if you want, employees. <coughs> the word slave is used there because in the first century Israel and even prior, People were having slaves for agriculture purposes. Not only for agriculture purposes, but also for indebtedness. If somebody was not capable of paying a debt back, he became a slave until the year of redemption. And God doesn't want mistreatment of the slave, like we picture in our mind right away, chained and beaten and so on. Mankind did that, but not God. Slaves were to be treated as pearls also in the eyes of God. So, for the sake of what's there, simply put, 
employees, employer. It talks to you right now, those who are bosses and have employees under their wings and so on. That's exactly what it means here. Verse 22b, slaves, employees, in all things obey those who are your masters, your bosses, on earth, not in heaven, of course, not with external service, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. The stress is on daily obedience to those above us. When he says in verse 22, in all things, Beloved, it's in pleasant stuff and unpleasant stuff. When the washrooms are dirty, somebody has to scribe them. The boss has the right to say, the washrooms are standing in need to be cleansed or to be cleaned. It has to be done. In all works, there are things that we don't like to do. However, they have to be done with sincerity of heart and done for the Lord. There is an unless here. There is an exception. If your boss is asking you, requesting the employer to do something completely outside the scriptures, violating the scriptures, it doesn't matter if the boss is safe or unsafe, seek another job. You don't have to do it. But when an employee serves his bosses sincerely, understanding Christ the way he served, he does not seek, the employee does not seek to be seen in the shop where he bends down to pick up a piece of paper or the chocolate bar on the floor. Don't wait for the boss to see you. He doesn't have to. Your heavenly boss sees you in heaven, but pick up the paper. If you say to yourself, it's not my job to do so, the ball is already dropped as an employee. Because we do not think, that, and, and it, it is the crossing of the line of understanding the most menial task. In our churches today, male and female are striving to be in leadership. Don't. Start by serving your people properly, always seeking the best in the object love, and in due time, you may, may only, have a, a position of authority. We ought to stop serve, seeking for a pat in the back. The pat in the back has already been given to you according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, of having been blessed of all these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. That's quite a bit of a pat in the back that can basically dislocate your shoulder. Verse 23, whatever you do, do you work heartily, circle heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men. Do you know what is the word heartily? Out of the soul, out of the viscera, out of your gods. Out of the soul. And what I have in mind here, it's the word botching. Nowadays, the tendency with the speed by which we travel life in all, in all areas of work, car dealing, name it, name it, we botch. The more we have needs, needs, uh, uh, means not to do mistakes by computerizing everything, the only thing that we're good at that we don't botch, it's when it's time to charge the people with money. There is no mistake at that place. Having said this, put Proverbs chapter 12, 24. 
and put Proverbs 18.9. Keep in mind one thing, beloved, and I do hear, I'm not going to boast, but I do hear spend a lot of time by myself where nobody sees me. Keep in mind at work, work. Nobody sees you for some people than they, when they work overtime and so on. But God sees the stewardship that we apply in these worldly situations with the world system that we work because you need to work to make a living and so on. Okay? Your boss might not be looking at you all the time, but God does. Okay? Can fool your boss. You can fool him easily. Easily. But there is one that cannot be fooled, and you know his name. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. The right pat on the back. The pat on the back on this earth are not much value. It's good. It's good to be told good job. But here, when he says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, it is the Lord's Christ whom you serve in everything. In verse 25, I have a request for you. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. I just, need, just have a suggestion. I cannot impose that because that would be sheer legalism here. There is an expression in the Christian faith, in our faith, that ought to disappear of our vocab completely. And this is this expression here. I swept the floor, didn't do the bathroom. Good enough. Not in Christianity. I know of a man, a very good man, a God man. His name is Yeshua. Uh, he happened a few months ago to come on earth to accomplish, this is your Good Friday right now, the totality of the plan of redemption. He could have cut his finger. That would have been blood. He could have decided, I will provide the atonement for my people. I'm going to cut an arm. Blood will be shed on the ground. My people will be forgiven. Good enough. On Good Friday, those of you who have rubbed shoulder with Roman Catholicism and all the paintings of the Spanish and Italian painters, they paint Christ on the cross with a skirt to hide the genitals. There was no such a thing in the time of Christ. The Roman way of executing people you were naked on the cross. For the last three hours out of six hours on the cross, the last three, the first three, he suffered the wrath of man. Heck of a deal. But the last three hours is when he said, Eli, Eli, laba shamashtami. What does it mean? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his humanity for three hours, God was not sustaining a relationship with Jesus Christ in his humanity. There is no such a thing as good enough with him. In his humanity was separated, not in his deity, cannot be. 
Christ took the penalty of our sins down to the last dredge. Who likes wine here? When you have a bottle, you don't drink the last drip. Today we do because of the chemical system that we have. Back then, the last drop you don't drink because that's the raisin, that's foggy. You don't taste that part. So he took the cross down to the last drop of what we throw in the garbage. And then for him, it was well enough. So what's, what's my point here to show off? No, no, my point is you're given a task in Christianity. You're given a task in donation. There is no such a thing as good enough. There is no such a thing as good enough. Yeah, but it was 10%, Father. Really? I don't count the percentage. You're not under the law. Why don't you do 44.1%? Simply because of the attitude that you have, that we have. It's going to be good enough. Verse 25. For he who does wrong, I read it already. Okay? There is no such a thing as losing the salvation. That's why. I'm going to read 25. No problem. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences. Oh, I'm afraid of this consequences. Am I going to lose my salvation? No, 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 no. But if you develop the good enough attitude in the messianic kingdom, you will lose rewards. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15, about losing rewards. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15, and Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. The good enough attitude is the wood, the hay, and the stubble. Take a match and put a little bit of fuel and put wood in your wood stove. Put hay and stubble. What is it going to do? It's going to burn off. But if you open your furnace at home and you have a nice fireplace, not gas, I mean a real one, and you put gold in it, silver and precious stones, they're going to be dusty, but they're not going to melt. This will be refined. The good enough will burn. Thank you, Father, for doing that for us. Verse 1. Master, it's plural here. Oi, curios. Okay, it's plural also in chapter 3, verse 23, verse 24, and 4 1. The word is plural also, 323, 324, 421. It's referring to bosses in the context here. And the context here is Christian bosses, those who operate companies. CEO, whatever the title can be, in Christianity. Grant to your slave justice, fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven, and so on. Okay? Justice, fairness, to be just, it's to correspond to the character of God. He is just, no respecter of person. Fairness, equality of treatment. Fairness, equality of treatment. Here, just for the sake of the crowd that we are, I'm going to give different interpretation are given here for fairness. I'm going to give you a few choices that you can, bosses, ponder upon, chew on slowly. Specifically with the word fairness. Grant your slave justice and fairness. Number one. Emancipation. Emancipation of the employees, meaning liberty and independence, should be given equally. Liberty and independence. To emancipate the person, that's the employees. The responsibility both way are to be kept by the boss and by the servant equally. Bosses, 
do your responsibility that you have to do. Employees, do yours also, and everything will work properly. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. Number three, I like it. It's to give the same treatment that you bosses got from God. Give it to the slaves. Give it to employees. What does it mean? Put your own showing grace, patience. You, you will have to fire. You will have to fire. Do it biblically. I fire you because of this. No bushing around, beating around. Huh? Because it's slow. I... I Firing you because you have a good enough attitude and I'm asking above this. Stop. Give me your keys back. That's biblical. The truth. Number four, equality in spiritual brotherhood. Of course, this is difficult for bosses because you have a number of employees not sustaining a relationship with God. Love them anyway. And when they are around and you talk to somebody that do sustain a relationship with God, carefulness here. Wise as a serpent type of thing. Number five, same task, same excellence, same pay. In other words, should not have the respect of person. You give an increase, give it to all. Point number four. Coffee time. Feel your coffee. We're doing excellent. We will finish on time. Coffee. We are doing well. We are doing good. Uh, I might borrow five minutes. Okay. Make a note of this while you are uh, relaxing a little bit. Note this. Do that here. Not this. The blue only. Make a note of the back on the page somewhere. I will reach the conclusion pretty soon. It's occupied, young man. Mm -hmm. It's occupied. Yeah. Ernie is, is probably, ah, oh, he's back there, okay. I thought you were still in the washroom, Ernie. <laughs> you go back to your no, seat. No. Under his radar. <laughs> I did not see you coming back to the desk there, you. Caroline, thank you so much for understanding that I need to cover a bit more. Because, like I said, I don't have enough for another session, so we need to we need to finish it. One thing that I was stuck on, I didn't say anything. About. In Romans, they refer to a woman. Romans fifteen refers to one calls women workers as a deacon in some. Deaconess, yes. So that's leadership. Isn't it? That's no, no, they cannot call the major shot. They serve. The deacons are serving the elder. It's not the position of leadership. Okay. The, the ladies can be deacon. They can, as long as the position is of deacon is defined properly. In too many churches, sometimes the deacons, they call the major shot. It's not quite in the center of what the Bible is asking. Deaconesses, it's a yes. Okay, bro. Not easy to teach when you know what the person do in front of you. <laughs> because I know, you know, you know, you know, so you tend to, okay. Who's in the washroom? Germain. Okay, we'll wait and we, we're doing very good actually.
Now we have reached uh, Arabic number four. Have a quick peek on your outlines. It's only two verses, three verses, because it's an inclusive subtraction. It's chapter four, verses two to four. Let's read. Devote yourself to prayer, circle devote. Keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, circle keeping alert. Praying at the same time for us, circle us as well. Circle that God, circle the word that. God will open up to us, circle us, a door for the word. So that, circle that, we may speak forth the mysteries of Christ, for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. The word devote con con basically conveys, it's an imperative, it conveys the breath of genuine spirituality. We have to pray. It's the very core, it's the very breath, not an offensive breath, but it's the very breath of spirituality. And he says, keep alert also in verse 1. That's the same alertness that Christ, when he prayed in Gethsemane, take the cup, take the cup, take the cup. It's to pray with anticipation. God said, drink the cup, drink the cup, drink the cup. But he was anticipating to be delivered from spiritual death, and he was. Very good example. It's in Matthew tw chapter 26, verse 38. And keep alert. You can replace the word alert, if you want to, by watchfulness. I like, I like this. Watchfulness. What is alertness or watchfulness? It's a mental alertness. It's a mental vigilance in the spiritual realm. I repeat. Watchfulness or alertness, it's a mental, it's mental watchfulness or mental alertness, alertness, and a vigilance in the spiritual thing. And unfortunately, those who are amillennialism, not believing in the return of Christ on the planet, cannot have this mental alertness and mental urgence and mental vigilance that he is coming back to reign on this planet for 1,000 years. And this is a beautiful anticipation that we don't have the right to allegorize. Of course, we need to anticipate the rapture first, but you might not be raptured. You might not, Ernie. We're not getting younger, brother. I don't need to teach you that, Father. Are you going to get raptured? Sure hope so. Yeah, sure hope so. But there is a percentage of chance that you might not be. And the, the mental alertness and the mental spirituality of it, and as if you go tonight, you're coming back with him. To reign with him. Heck of a deal. That's a mental spirituality, spirituality of something that is more than tangible. It's something to watch for. It's beautiful. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we need to, talk, uh, to think about the false teacher. False teacher because it's the content of Colossians. They are the ministers of Satan. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 1 Peter 5, 8. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It's just to put you in the context of alertness in the primary context, which is not the second coming. It was just an example of what Colossians is all about, about the false teacher around in the Lucas Valley. Verse 2b, thanksgiving. Simply put, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you and Christ Jesus. 
this is something that I have to work on. In everything, give, th give thanks instead of compla complaining or being stressed out. This is a weakness in my walk. I need you to be thankful around me so that I, you may display and that I may borrow your perfume fragrance of it. Three and four, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have been imprisoned. When Christ was manifested in the flesh, when he came on earth as a man for three point, no, 33 years roughly, he never asked anybody to pray for him. Really? Really. He never asked anybody to pray for him because he was God. But Paul, when he says for us as well, Paul is not quite God. He's a bit like Francois. He has a sin nature that he bears with. So he's asking the people to pray for him. Like I would like to ask you to pray for me, and it's not in the, it's, it, 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 for him it was in addition, not substitutional. You don't stop praying for other things. You add us in your prayers. Add me in yours. Verse 3b, I ask you twice to circle two that's. Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open us the door. That will have a double usage here. And the first usage of it, it's an open door because Paul is an evangelist. He is a prophet, yes, he is an apostle, yes, but he is also an evangelist. That he might open, have open door to evangelize the people. Why the pronoun us? Because Timothy is with him, among others as well. You have Timothy around him right now, because it's a light imprisonment. And you have other associates with him, which we will see somewhat later. I need to make a statement here that will put things in perspective. Did you know something? That there is no power in prayers. The Muslim pray three times a day, by the way. There is no power in prayers. Prayer does not open doors, but God who answers prayers does. Prayer does not open doors, but God who decides to close them or to open them works. We ask him. And we have an example of both in the scriptures of doors that are open and doors that are closed. Closed. Acts 16.6. Acts 16.6, you compare that with 1 Corinthians 16.9. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, an open door. And what strikes me the most so far with the first death, Paul basically asking an opportunity to evangelize, in that context here, he's not asking, pray for me to be released. He's not asking, pray for me to be released. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I would like to be a Paul. I think I have a long way to go. What a man. The only thing that is concerned about pray for me that I might have the right word and more opportunities to do evangelism. <laughs> and the second that, I will elaborate slightly, uh, so that we may speak forth the mystery singular of Christ. Because Christ himself is the mysteries with ramifications attached. We basically have four mysteries uh, here. Uh, the first one was in Ephesians chapter 3. The first one that Paul spoke about that we have studied, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. What was that mystery? You don't need to remember. It was the mystery of the body, the body of Christ, Jews and Gentiles, it, the one new man. 
Jews and Gentiles, the one new man. The second one was the indwelling Christ residing in you. Where was it? Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 29. 24 to 29. The third one from Paul that we have studied, it's the church and the bride, the bride of Christ. The church being the bride of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. And another one of Paul that we have not studied in this capacity, it's the mystery of translation, Ernie, being raptured. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. There is more, but that's the four by Paul, okay? Verse 4, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak concerning these mysteries, that he may make it clear. Because this, these mysteries were unrevealed truth in the Old Testament dispensations, which has now been revealed in the New. And Paul is a steward of them. I repeat. They are not mysteries because they are a difficult thing to understand. They are mysteries simply because these are truths that were not revealed in the Old Testament, which has been now revealed to the, Old, the New Testament prophets and apostles building the foundation. Arabic number 5 outlines in witness and speech, chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsider, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech, Logos, always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, circle seasoning with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. It's witness of speech. Circle, conduct yourself. The context, it witnessing what do we display as perfume spiritual perfume and it means to to walk among the outsiders which are given to you daily opportunities unsaved people to walk among them with wisdom that we may male and female be attractive to them You know when people say to you guys, ladies, particularly men, nice hairdo. That's what Kathy does for the people. And they leave the shop. Wow. All arranged and so on. And then they go home sometimes and they put a dress, an outfit with high heels type of thing. What an outfit. Where do you go all dressed up like this? It is attractive. Are we wearing high heels and nice garments? in our spiritual walk to this place so that the people after 15 years say, what about your outfit? You're so kind. Our outfit in the spiritual should be white, shouldn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> but you can wear in your garden on your knees full of dirt and display white also. <laughs> or at the shop, these guys don't work in white. Usually not. Anyway, good, good, good observation. So that the gospel may have a favorable expression in the eyes of the beholder or in the eyes of the outsider. 